Hello, I'm Penelope Maver, and welcome to Earth Converse podcast, where we explore our relationship and conversations with the earth, all in the hope of inspiring a deeper connection with ourselves, each other, and the earth that is our home. And on my New Year's bonus uh, podcast, I said that I wasn't going to do one. I wanted to leave the 2021 to a very special guest. And this is a very special guest. Honestly, I feel so emotional. Uh, when I saw her, I started crying because uh, this is Julia Middleton. She is such, um, I don't know, a visionary. Um, she established Common Purpose um, a leadership organization which helped leaders, uh, you know, navigate across boundaries. And I had the fortune of getting a call from um, Julia. I still remember I was on the houseboat and I'd done the interview with um, Alison and in Nottingham. And you rang up. I, we didn't even talk. And you rang up and you said, oh, no, Nottingham's not for you. I think they'll like you in Brighton. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I headed down to Brighton and you were right. I loved Brighton. And so I was such fortunate to be common purpose. I mean, this woman, she has been campaigning for progressive, diverse leadership, leadership, you know, diversity and leadership for forever, Julia, no? And, um, you know, and now she's, um, well, she gave, handed over the reins, uh, common purpose, chief executive, but um, she has started this woman emerging in isolation. And not only, we're going to talk about that, we're going to talk about common purpose, and not only has Julia created ripples globally, but she has managed to do this with this uh, full, beautiful life with a you know, husband, five children. I don't know how she does it. And and I think about, because um, I, as a leader, Julia, you really believe in potential. You believed in my potential. You believe in others. I think you've got a deep love for humanity. And um, you see what's possible. And you lift people. And um, But also, you know, and I also think of this lovely Mary Oliver. Um, I'm a bit rambling now, but Mary Oliver poem, you know, you know, you know, what, and tell me, what are you to do with your wild, precious life? For your one wild, precious life. And you've, I don't know, you've really honoured your life, you know? So welcome, my special guest. <gasps> oh, <fine. Good. laughs> yeah. I've written it down. <laughs> oh, wonderful, yeah. Well done, well done, Penny. Yeah. So you've done the same. Been? step yeah it takes a while to step in you know to get that whew, momentum and I do feel like yeah turning 50 it's like enough I'm gonna speak up I'm gonna do something <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually I mean maybe it was you know maybe it is on that like um I had plans for my 50th but also I think this COVID you know I had the stirrings of the of the of the podcast but I think it was this this COVID, this emerging out of isolation, I think that's true, really the boost, you know, of really going into that. Tell us about women emerging in isolation. Um, well, you know, for as long as I was running Calm Purpose, which was about getting people who were very different and and, and pulling diversity together and discovering that, getting them to discover that life was much more interesting if it was diverse. <laughs> um, and, you know, over the years, lots of people said to me, will you run a leadership program for women and things like that? And the answer was no, that's not what Common Purpose was about. So I can never do it. Mm. But, um, you know, if you if you look at my photographs of as a 19 year old, I'm 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 standing there in some fountain on Capitol Hill doing the Equal Rights Amendment March, which of course never succeeded and still hasn't, but still. Um, so women has always been a big issue for me and, you know, squandering talent is a big issue for me. Mm. Um, there's nothing more sinful than to squander talent and and if you if you have 50% of the populations whose talent 
um, is not brought to the fore or when the talent is brought to the fore, it's, it's not authentic. Mm. So, you know, I'm not that crazy about the word authentic. Yeah. It can, um, you know, it annoys me sometimes and you sort of say to somebody, it's a bit like unconscious bias. The answer is just because it's unconscious doesn't make it any better. Um, and, you know, if you're authentically racist, then could you kindly switch it off and don't be authentic? But um, at another level, authentic is important. And, you know, if women are not the leaders they want to be, they are the leaders that they know they have to be in a man's world, then you're not getting the best that you could from women. And um, so women has always been a big issue for me. Um, and, and, you know, lots of things will come out of the COVID period, but the COVID period is, 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 a, is a bit of a perfect storm. There are lots of other storms going on. Um, you know, we have to change lots of things as a result of COVID and one of them is the approach to leadership. We've got to find a way of cooperating, cooperating with each other um, in a way that we haven't in the past. And women know a lot about collaborative leadership. So bringing women to the fore, pulling them out of isolation and I see isolation as being the opposite of collaboration. Um, you know, but also connecting women up across the world, because that seems to me to be terribly important. And there are too many things that claim to be global. They're not. They're really Western. Mm. And, um, you know, it was a call the other day with a group of people from South Asia and a group of people, women from, from the US and halfway through the ones from South Asia. And I, I take credit that if I hadn't been chairing it, they wouldn't have said it because they would have been polite. But, you know, halfway through, they suddenly said, to the Americans, we are not your sisters, you know. Could you stop talk calling us sisters? Yeah, okay. You know, could you just recognize that being a woman is different in different parts of the world and we don't all have to be like you? Mm. And actually one of the other women also said, and by the way, American women have firmly come off the pedestal in the last <laughs> six or eight months. Yeah. Um, so I think the need for women to understand each other, to have more cultural intelligence about each other, seems to me to be incredibly important. And then the truth is, I got excited by women emerging from isolation, and then I got educated by it. You know, for the last eight or nine months, I've talked to a lot of extraordinary women and both seen how much progress has been made and also how little progress has been made and how much women are living somebody else's story. Um, and, and so, I, you know, women emerge from crisis is a bit of a passion for me. And, and you know, I'm incredibly boring. I, I worked for Com Purpose for 30 years. Um, <laughs> I deeply believe that anything that's worth doing, you have to commit to for a very long time. Um, so when I was looking at women emerging from isolation and the ideas, I sort of thought to myself, you know, the big question is not, am I gonna be passionate about this for the next six months? Am I going to be passionate about this for the next six years? And I, I can't do 30 years because I'll almost certainly be dead by then. Oh, I bet you will. But, <laughs> but um, the, you know, I'm very happy to slowly build up women emerging from isolation and just, you know, add a tiny bit to a jigsaw. And it's a it's a big jigsaw with lots of parts. But I think there's an important part about women being leaders and the kind of leaders they want to be. And um, that's 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 what. Um, and then, and then, you know, women, you know, you can see you can have all the grand ideas and, I, you know, Penny will only smile if I'll, my, my father's expression was, you know, you have to have your eyes on the hills and your feet on the ground. So the eyes on the hills, I could see the dream. I could see why it was needed and I could see how we could add value. 
but then the feet on the ground was what was the method to do it and 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 it is it is quite funny you know when I when people say so what is women emerging from isolation I say it's a it's a huge global <laughs> film club they just laugh at me they go what but you know if eventually the films that come out each week that are short but they're so compelling and they so influence people in their thinking women in their thinking then then you know that's the feet of the grand mechanism to achieve this grand dream and um so that's what women emerging from isolation is mm, there's so much there there's so much there and i like i think you wrote about um yeah is it ambitious is ambitious enough but it's it actually no but it's that essential jigsaw you know jigsaw I, piece. I, yeah and I, this this little this little piece and i also even going into um you said about also writing you know at the moment it's for it's okay maybe english speaking with internet access but that's even that you know that's at the moment it is just there it is the, but it's the it's the momentum isn't it you know what the do with it? yeah and it's and like the potential is unlimited you know unlimited. do you know before you know mm. before christmas so um, my youngest child is a boy and he's a young engineer. And I said to him, what are you listening on podcast? And he has now listened to 62 hours of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. OK. And it's still only on what the fire brigade learned. OK. And I said to Tom, why are you doing that? And he said, mum, if I'm going to be an engineer, this is the kind of stuff I need to have listened to. And I thought good on you you know you're not just a boy or a girl too <laughs> you can emerge from isolation but the important thing is that i was just thinking about him playing with it and then i talked to another woman and then another woman this was all just the week before christmas and they all said you know we've been on inquiries in the last year where you end up making recommendations that are quite practical but if you went upstream from the recommendations, you would find on all the inquiries probably the same messages, which is, um, you know, in the narrow case of Grenfell, for example, you know, there were three different parts of the fire brigade and they weren't working together and they were counter briefing each other. Yeah, i.e. if you went upstream on all the inquiries that were happening around the world, and this woman suggested to me, why don't we get 20 women who are on inquiries all over the world, get right. them together and say, what did you learn upstream? Right. And I thought, that's brilliant. And then I also thought, you don't need me. Yeah. Just use the Women Emerging from Isolation brand and then go make that happen. Exactly. The unleashing of that and just, you know, the the little fires everywhere and people connecting. And I, I love that. And also in terms of, um, well, I mean, it's your, oh, the God, there's so much there, um, Julie, what you said about, even about the, like, you know, what's my, you know, my story. I think it takes years and self inquiry you know you should talk about the authenticness but actually what is authentic i mean it's to, you know what is my true nature as opposed to my beliefs that i've picked up along the way that i don't even know if they're my they're my beliefs or not they're just sort of that societal thing from my parents from my from my yeah from my leaders from my influences the systemic nature that has helped me inform of what i'm meant to be I just, you know, so it's sort of like to know our, what is that, our own truth, you know? Do you know, sometimes I think that, um, you know, most of my childhood, I never knew who I was because I was always one nationality, living in another country, being educated in another language, yes? So... I always had, you know, I was like an octopus with a foot in different parts of the world. And all my childhood, I used to think that meant that I was a permanent outsider. And then as I've grown older, I've realized what it gave me. It gave me, it didn't give me, you know, you know that, that TED talk of the danger yeah. of a single story. 
Yeah. I never had a yeah. I never had a single story. Um, and I I think when I meet other women, I often think, I think you know you didn't have a single story either, um, and 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 I recognise them quite quickly, but. I think there's great advantage in not having a single story as a child, because it's a much bigger thing to break out of. Absolutely, and but but also think this. I think the people that don't have the the single story are the cultural influences. Like, and I know I've heard lots of you know listened to lots of stories of, about people where they you know they're multi you know multicultural multilingual lived different. Um, uh, you know, making sense of their own ancestry or own roots and trying to understand that and feeling like I don't belong, but actually it's their, it's the kind of their superpower because there's their cultural flexibility and adaptability and to see different realities, you know? I, and, and I think yeah. actually, yeah, I do think, I think, yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, and, you know, as, as, um, it's interesting because I, my first language was French. And, you know, I remember my kids saying, Mum, what's this in, Eng in French? And I would say, well, that's difficult. And they would say, oh, Mum, don't be difficult. You know, what is it in yeah, French? Yeah, it must, it say, must be a well, translation. There isn't a perfect translation of this. Oh, Mum, you're just being difficult. Well, actually, there isn't. It has, and understanding that, point about language is it's not a sort of a science where this equals this mm. it's much more of an art where this is a blend of this mm. um i think that um the blending of cultures is much more interesting and and to some extent i as a child i didn't have the benefit of a single story mm. yes but yes. there's an that, that foundation that yeah. yeah but as an adult i had the benefit of not having a single yes, story. yes yeah and you're finding and I love the model you know and I'll put it all the links you know from your from your books and the TED talks and women emerging but your core and flex is a beautiful offering of that and I guess maybe even you know you you, you felt you finding your core and, and the flex and even common purpose can be the core your 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 commitment to the to you know stick around and give things time and and uh, empower. But there's a real danger, Penny, that you, it's interesting, when I started producing Core and Flex, I realized quite rapidly that everybody thought that the most important thing that made people up um, was their core. Mm. And that the core was so important. Yeah. And, and it's taken me, and I, maybe I should rewrite the book, and just reinforce that the flex is just as important Absolutely. as who you are as your core is. And in fact, sometimes it's even more important. You know, sometimes I think the only purpose in having a core is to allow you to have a huge flex. Yeah, yeah, that state, yeah. Because you need that, that you need, you need that pole, or what is was the analogy in order yeah. to, to weave in the, I mean, the tree, I can just imagine sort of, I know, a tree. The, 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 the one that I like is the idea that you need an anchor, yeah. but if the rope between the anchor and the boat is too tight, then when the waves come, the yeah. boat will crash yeah. up. But that. if the rope is long enough, yeah. the boat will go with the waves. Yeah. So the flex is just as important as the core. Yeah. The, my ability to say that is something I am completely relaxed about doesn't you know it's not going to speak into my core i'm not going to demand anything there um i am i'm flexible to you and then having people who remind you of that and mm -hmm. constantly i i don't i told you the story but yeah. when my eldest son got married um he married um in bangalore to a young woman from bangalore and i remember in the weeks before the wedding um he said to me, Mum, are you going to wear a sari? And I said, no, absolutely not, because um, one, I'm not from India, and two, I've got quite a lot of fat here and I don't want anybody seeing it. And um, and one of, and so I'd taken quite a strong stand, and one of my daughters came into the room and said, Mum, I thought you said what you, wear, what you wear, what your clothes are, I thought that was in your flex. 
and I suddenly <laughs> put it there. And my first thought is, don't let your kids read your books. But the second one was, he's right, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if if I've always said that what I wear doesn't bother me and isn't, I'll always adapt that that's in my flex, then of course I have to wear a sari. So I did. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think it's all this, you need people to remind you what your core is and remind you, I thought that was in your flex, mum. <laughs> Lovely marriage. And I, I what well, and I guess, you know, where I I love um, you know, exploring that flex or what is well, what is your core? I mean, I think it's a lifelong journey. And I also in terms of the flex and the flex, you know, where the triggers. Usually you can, you know, when you get a strong reaction to something, whether you like something a lot or or you or defensive, or you go, oh, what is that? you know, or something really stirs in you, I think that's a good information, isn't it? Well, I, I also think, you know, if you overlook, now that I'm 62, I'm seeing both, you know, you watch yourself get older and you, you have to keep a very sharp eye on your ability to get pompous. Mm. And, um, and I watch women around... Do you know, the last week before lockdown, um, I was in Boston and I was doing this talk and there was a really impressive woman, a woman of colour who is in their sort of 70s. And I did my talk and she, she very thoughtfully sort of looked at me at the end and they could see her sort of piercing me with her eyes. And then finally she said, you know, I have thought for years and years to um to come out of isolation to 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 achieve power and to be able to make change and be to produce difference are you seriously telling me julia that now that i have finally got that power i have to hand it on to the next generation and and my honest answer was yes i am asking you to. yes please do that, that, <laughs> That's 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 the game. That's what you have to that do. That is leadership. But you have to hand on your power and then watch people's backs as they start to use it. Absolutely. But but my generation tends to, you know, they get bigger and bigger core. You know, I wouldn't do that. Well, wouldn't you? Are you sure? <laughs> you know, I would never have done that. Are you sure? Um, and you know this sort of assumption that 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 um, my father always used to say wisdom was an illusion. It was just a word to make you feel better about getting old. And, <laughs> and I think I think there's some truth in that. You know, um, wow, it, it's it, it, yeah, it doesn't equate um, in terms of age and wisdom, does it? And I really I do like how Greta, Greta Thunberg, you know, that about you know where. Just where are the adults? And I and I do see it even from, I mean, we, like, we're so many of us, we're not actually fully integrated whole adults, are we? We're like these older bodies and, uh, you know, but adolescents, we haven't really gone through a deep inquiry and really stepped into our adultness. We may have children, we may have, um, well, we may have in terms of that real I'm not sure adulthood is particularly attractive I think I'd, I'd, I think um, you know remaining um, a bit of a rebellious teenager um, is is pretty important and you know again when you become 62 people begin to sort of um, uh, flatter you and you know it's really important not to fall for it because yeah. then you're no longer rebellious. No, but I, I mean in terms of so it's sort of like a, the maybe it's sort of the, the evolution that are all parts of ourselves. And I actually I'm going to interview uh, Bill Plotkin who has um, my one of my favourite books of my Wild Mind and Soulcraft. But using the the idea of our you know the the nature's nature's. Uh, I don't know patterns or cycles of life you know our self is our 
is our childness and our, and our ability to be in, in our senses and, and connected to the earth. And that's, and we inevitably go from child to, to yeah. Yeah. You know, the teenage adolescence, which is, you know, the, the wild, the making sense of things, even the, the dark, who am I? But ultimately we have to emerge into adulthood for the, for the community and then we and then we come through to um, you know uh, sort of well I suppose leave this earth really and that sort of but maybe of but maybe it's possible to come out of adulthood back into teenagehood exactly but that's the thing holding like to keep our wild adolescent self our you know to go in that darkness to be to test the boundaries that all Penny, so few people do it sorry so few so few people do it absolutely they just, they just of it in their pomposity yes they stick in this adult north that isn't, isn't actually true because they haven't really integrated their you know that, that part of that self because i think you know yeah i want that podcast yeah I do yeah but i just love that i love i kind of just like the theory that all you know exploring all parts of ourselves which is part going back to that core and that flex and um i mean you know one that's really come alive for me and you'll appreciate this is you know, with Black Lives Matter and go delving into, you know, Robin D'Angelo at saying, you're a racist. It's like, and my, you know, and she says this, it's all like, no, but, you know, I, 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 my, you know, big relationship with this, with Maori, I've got Maori friends, I work for Common Purpose, you know, <laughs> sort of, and she goes, this is what we do, that actually, you know, it's the progressives that say, oh, no, but I'm da 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 I can't be racist, but I am. And she goes, that's our default, you know, like you are because of those biases. And um, and, just, and she should really say we are. Yeah, we are. We are, we're all of us. And it's sort of, and I get, maybe there's a spectrum of sort of people yeah. that, you know, like yourself, which is much more um, in terms of um, enlightened or, out of, or, you know, being that um, ally and always being part of that amplifying um, diverse voices, where some people just, you know, stuck in, stuck in this, so it's a spectrum, but it's really shaken me up about my contribution to uh, you know, white supremacy and, you know. And willingness, willingness to, um, but also, yes, willingness to, to ask the questions and ask the questions of yourself, but you know, the, uh, it's interesting, the, when I was writing the cultural intelligence book, quite a lot of um, people of colour that I knew who were particularly one person, who's a very famous actor um, from Pakistan, he kept on sending me messages saying, Julia, don't, don't be, in your liberalism, don't become intolerant, don't become intolerant. And I was sort of going, really? I mean, yeah. I can't do this. This is too confusing. Yeah. And he kept sending me a message saying, you know, there's a reason why this book hasn't been written, Julia. You're going to get slaughtered, whatever you say. And there's a real danger that we all, because it's too difficult, become immensely silent yeah. and, 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 and get worried. And, yeah. and we don't, you know, we don't prod it, prod it back. I, I, again, I was at a university, the, the end of last year, well, end of 2019. Um, and, um, you know, you listen to all these young people and you know, the answer is this is not about, this isn't really about diversity here. You're not talking about inclusiveness here. What you're really just trying to do is make sure that your particular community's card gets to the top of the pack if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and that isn't inclusive. That's just reshuffling the pack. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that when I said it, you know, there was half the audience saying, what's this white woman saying this for? And, and you know, sometimes the questions I ask, I get the right words wrong. Um, and I push back in the wrong way and then get told I'm racist. Um, and that's always a really frightening experience. Um, and you go home and you sort of tear yourself to pieces and, and 
try and put yourself back together again. But I think you have to carry on trying to find the answers honestly. Um, even though the journey is is quite frightening. Mm. 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 There's a real, yeah. What, what, what frightens you? What frightens me yeah. generally? Yeah, no, in that, in that, in that sense of journey. Well, I could say, which is which is sort of trite and not true, that I'm frightened that I go silent and don't keep asking the questions because I know I will. Mm, yeah. But I do get frightened that as I get older, I I ask the questions in the wrong way and upset people. Um, and particularly upset myself because I've upset people. Mm. So I think I think it's you know if you if you fought all your life to live with the fact that you have biases, but to overcome them and to to open to them and move them around and 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 you know bring people together and convening people. When then somebody accuses you of not being that, it does hurt really hard. And so um, you do get frightened by that. Um, but I, I, you know, the world needs a lot of mirrors holding up at the moment. And so those of us who are prepared to put ourselves at risk to hold the mirror up and you've done that you know you've done more than i don't know anybody that i personally know in terms of really using that using your privilege mm. in order to dismantle a, a a system you know that upholds i remember you saying oh you looked around at a board meeting i think you were in the industrial society and going white middle-aged men oh my goodness there must be this is not representative society. There must, I need to do something, you know. And you've, yeah. And also this constantly work in progress and, you know, am I enough, you know, sort of that. The shame, you know, like there's a bit of shame. I carry a lot of the shame or, and sort of what was my, yeah, what's my role? What did my ancestors, <laughs> you know, what, what part they've played and, yeah. And then, you know, given that, what now? So what can I, you know, what can I do? Actually, um, on the book of White Fragility, I, I when I left it, I, I, I sort of actually to have um, to look inside ourselves to uh, to give feedback to others um, about the impact they have on us, which is difficult anyway, regardless of whether it's about race. It's just, you know, our own self-inquiry our own looking into our own mirror is hard enough you know anyway hmm and so yeah um and you had speaking of the mirror so um you have had a, you just in the new year you one of the videos was posted had a big impact on you and uh, do you want to talk about that? Oh, I, um, I mean, it had lots of impacts on me. It's, um, it had a big impact because um, the first one is that it was this young woman, German woman, and she wrote me an email and said that, um, that the, the women emerging from isolation films had meant a lot to her and made her think a lot. And... You know, you you um, you know, we're all bad at sending an email saying, "By the way, what you just did was brilliant. I hope I do it enough." But um, sometimes I think nobody remembers to send me one, so <laughs> I, I love that one. But um, she talked. She sent me this email that was that was haunting the central paragraph of it, of saying, 
you know, I've spent my whole life trying to be a boy. And she just expressed it. And actually the fact that she was German and not speaking in her first language made actually, funnily enough, the paragraph was even more moving. Mm. Um, and so I, I rang her up and we had this long conversation about, you know, if, if, if boys are always the winners, then I, I, then I want to be a boy. And, and so that was a fascinating conversation. And then about two or three days later, she had been through, as a result of our call, um, her old photographs as was her as a child. And she, she, she produced this photograph of two kids on the side of, it's in my head, it's a basketball court, but I don't know what it is. But th there's one blonde kid with sort of, um, hair that looks like the mother had cut it. Um, and I say that because I used to do yeah. that to my kids. Um, and sitting in a sort of, you know, elbows on knees, wide, legs wide open, ready to pounce. And, and, and um, a very masculine and, and interesting pose. And she sent me a message and said, by the way, that boy sitting there is actually me. And she said, I even remember the moment that the photograph was taken and I tried to look like a boy that was a winner. Mm -hmm. And um, it touched me because um, actually that child looked lots like one of my daughters used to look. Um, and it made me think about myself too. Um, I don't think I had an extreme experience like Kat catcher did but I had bits of it and um and I wondered if because hang on the important piece of this is also that she was pregnant and she was thinking about um how she was going to bring up her child and um and it made me think you know um so we produced a film it's a beautiful film absolutely got to watch it it's it it I I, it's impossible to be not touched by it, in my view. And actually, I think almost all boys should watch it too. Um, but uh, it made me think, I can see a bit of myself in that. I can see a bit of one of my daughters in that. And I can also see why didn't I think this through when I was pregnant, the way she's thinking it through when she's pregnant. And... Um, it made me think all kinds of different things. And then it became clear that she was pregnant not with a girl, but with a boy. Um, and that led to quite an interesting conversation of, you know, um, so I've got three girls in the middle and a boy at each end. And, um, and you know, you want to bring up your daughter's the way we want to but you also want to bring up your sons and um it it reminded me of a story about my son um uh which uh he he the the eldest son is sort of when he was sort of like actually still very very handsome but he was always very handsome and he when he was about 22 23 24 he started a rugby team so he was this very handsome very very sporty good leader um very successful rugby team and they were playing one day and they were absolutely beating the favorites who were the other team and the coach from the other team walked over towards me I could see him coming and he came up to me and he said are you John Middleton's mother and I said, yes, so wondering what was coming next. And he then said, um, I never thought that we would be beaten by a rugby team that chose pink as their color. Mm. Now, not only did they have pink as their shirts, mm. a lot of the, his team even had found pink rugby boots for men, yeah? And it was just really, really interesting because actually I'd never noticed that he'd chosen pink and actually he never really noticed that he'd chosen pink. 
And, you know, go back to unconscious bias. You know, the world will be better when you have unconscious equality. Does that make sense? And I love the fact that he chose pink and didn't even recognize that he had. It goes back, you know, that 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 system. But the sort of thing, this thing about your your own, what it sort of triggered in you, and can you can you have you delved into deeper why it would sort of like really touched you about being this yeah this sort of wanting to be a boy or do you feel you you're in terms of you making it in the world and you know you could create a global organization to have to be that you know. What? Because then it's sort of like male traits or female traits or. There's a whole, you know, yeah. there is such a language of leadership that's mm. that's so male, mm. and you know, I, I adore my husband, and he half understands when I start talking about this, but he doesn't completely understand because, you know, when you're in the middle of it, you don't really understand. Mm. But there is, I the the degree to which. Um, men have written the the rules for the world. Um, I, you know, th th they've written them to such an extent that you've got girls doing everything they can to be more boyish. I mean, it's just, it's so tragic that um, it that. You know that touched me a lot, but also that it touched me a lot that you know I've gobbled up life. Um, and here was I meeting a thirty-year-old girl who was asking questions that I almost certainly should have asked when I was thirty. Actually, I had my first child. I was twenty-six, so I should have asked them at twenty-six. You know, yeah, um, I should have, would have, could have. Yeah, yeah, I know, but it's quite important to to recognise that. Yeah. Uh, and to recognize that if I had, maybe I'd, I mean, you know, uh, my kids have become my best friends. I, um, I, I enjoy being with them and I'm very proud of them. They do remarkable things, all of them, all five of them. Yeah. Um, but maybe they'd be even more remarkable if I'd been a, more careful as a mother, you know? So you, you do, I think you have to carry on asking yourself endless questions. Absolutely. And I think, oh, and I really feel like sort of the, well, each generation should be more evolved. And I see it, you know, between, you know, my, my sisters who have more, I think, more um, evolved relationships with their, with their partners and their, and their children than we ever had as, you know, with mum and dad. So I think that it's, it's it, you know, we speed up that consciousness. So the fact that she is half your age, you know, it's a good thing. It's a sort of a good sign. Oh, it's there, fantastic. You know, it's and, fantastic, but he can go backwards, Penny. Yeah, yeah. And well, come on, you know, when Trump got off that bus and said those things about women, I assumed that his campaign was going to be dead in the water. Oh, yeah. Was it? No, it wasn't. Did women vote for him in vast numbers? Yes, despite what he'd said. Yeah. So it's it's not, you know, as soon as you take progress for granted in either women's rights or in democracy or anything or in rule of law or whatever, as soon as you take progress as self-evident and you, you produce your own definition of what progress is, then, then I think you're in trouble. I think it's no, a constant one, fight. Yeah. It is. And it's because, I mean, it's the sort of like towards the more light, the more darkness, isn't it? There's the dark, the dark and the shadow, you know? And I think, I think, well, I think Trump highlighted that. I think there's, there's a, there's a, you know, for want, you know, to, it, it brings up that, that, that darkness. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I get, you know, and it's the, I know it's it's integrating going back to sort of the integration of ourselves, so our light and our dark, or what we what our, you know. I love the, about regrets, you know, put them at the altar of your life, you know, to inform yeah. the next phase. Or yeah, you know, and don't 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 riddle yourself with guilt from yeah. them, but let them inform what you do next. Exactly, you know, exactly, yeah. Next, I'm going to be a grandmother. Perhaps yeah. I'll be a better grandmother if I do. If I, you know, it's it's all about constantly. 
yeah, it is, you know, and, you know, I love, I, I don't know, can a parent, I think it's so, I mean, it's the ultimate courageous act to have a, to have a child and, and, you know, and to grow up this, this being. When you go, you know, can you ever, yeah, be enough? And, you know, you just have to, I love the, you know, where it's the good enough parenting. It's sort of, you know, you do what you can with what you've got, you know, you created, yeah, and the, oh, goodness, it's so big. But I love also, um, you know, this, I know my own journey about, I remember sitting in circle, it was in New Mexico desert in, the, in a vision quest, and, um, and I was going to go out, and it was about uh, love in terms of, you know, I want to say I love the world, but where's the, where's the evidence of that? And, um, and then Ray, who I, I, I've interviewed twice as my mentor, you love him, and he, he just, he goes, um, well, I, I see it in you. And, and what the question, though, was, um, do you know your inner man? He's a Jungian psychotherapist, so that was probably the thing. But, and I think that's a really interesting thing about how women integrate their into man, you know, to explore what that means. You know, it's the animus and the anima, you know, to really go into who is that and to resolve that, you know, to, um, to well, to resolve it, resolve. Um, but that's a lovely exploration. And I think as, um, because not to get stuck into that language of male or female traits or whatever, what is, you know, the leadership, but actually each individual person integrates their own, you know, woman or man side of themselves. You know, while I'm while you're talking, I'm laughing to myself. Um, I uh, <laughs> when I had teenage kids, I realised that um, I had to be seen to be listening to them, and I had to listen to them. But equally, they were pretty boring. <laughs> uh, so Are you having the same experience? <laughs> I took up tapestry. Yeah, because oh, yeah. actually, you, you've got something to do, but you can listen. Uh, I didn't like knitting, but I like tapestry. Ah, and nice and it's 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 funny, isn't it? Because tapestry, you you can either make, I know you're supposed to get a sort of pattern and you follow it. Mm. Well, I don't. I make it up as I go, right? And so I do ones, and you know, all the, everybody's got one of you know a bit of your life is this. So I do a bit of that, and then you know you this, and then and it sort of evolves into a picture. And um, and I think it's the same thing. You have to sort of um, you can't follow the pattern. You've got to you've got to you've got to let something emerge, and um, and you've got to be confident as it emerges that it's good enough. And and so you know if if you get Tom and he shows you his cushion, he always loves pointing out that. Um, because he was at the time he was into sailing so I'd got one of these squares you know with north south east west or whatever it is and I put west and east on the wrong side and I remember him pointing it out to me and I said oh what the hell and I just left it yeah you know, he loves the fact that it's a flaw in his tapestry and and of course I should have unstitched it and done it properly but it's part of the story so it you is. keep it in <laughs> Um, and so everywhere on my true. tapestries, everywhere on my tapestries, there's <laughs> absolutely crazy mistakes. Um, and, you know, something was supposed to look like an elephant and actually ended up looking like a sort of tank or something. I have no idea. But, you know, but whatever you've done is good enough. So you just keep going. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And, and it will sort itself out and become part of the story. Yeah. And and I love weaving these stories of the tapestries. I love that. I love that. I mean, it's such a big metaphor. I interviewed um, Lorraine Smith, and she talks about actually um, being a spinner and a weaver, and um, creating threads of integrity. And then you know, and but it's a lovely metaphor of um, actually on the lonely. There's a book called I think it's Oliver Lang. Yeah. She's, I'm weaving, we're, we're, we're ducking and diving. So I, um, what I, how about, um, do you want to say something just about common purpose and just 
you know, a little bit about that and then about Sky Blue because part of my thing is, like, to your point is right weaving back is that, you know, doing a woman's program, well, no, that's separate. You don't want to do it because that's not what Common Perth is about. And so Sky Blue for me is the, is the, um, the big about the environmentalist, but it's always integrated. It's part of the whole too, isn't it? And so why is it separate and what does that, yeah, what's the vision there too? So, um, you know, um, uh, I was um, 29 and I started Com Purpose and it, it felt so unbelievably obvious that um, most leadership development taught you how to be a professional and it didn't talk to you, teach you about how to be a citizen. Most leadership development taught you how to operate in your own space, um, whether that's an organization or a city or a community or, or whatever. Um, but, but, but you have to be able to operate outside your own space if you're going to deal with the really messy problems that cross all the boundaries. Um, most leadership development <laughs> didn't lift the spirit. Most leadership development didn't... didn't persuade people that they wanted to be leaders. Most leadership development was, was done with peers who were like you. And um, so Calm Purpose was just so obvious to me that you would run um, you know, experiential learning programs based on a place. You would take people out into that place. Um, you would persuade them that they're both professionals and citizens and that the two weave together inside them, that they could achieve wonderful things either by making something wonderful happen or by helping somebody else make something wonderful happen. Um, uh, that that democracy didn't just require them to to vote, but it required them to go out into the civic space, into the square, and 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 hold the powerful to account, um, and to make things happen. Uh, and 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 Com Purpose really sort of built out of that. So that was the sort of dream that you would wake up sleepwalking citizens. Yeah, I love that. I remember you saying between sleepwalking citizens and politicians, there is a space. Um, and then in practice, you know, um, you could recruit people from all kinds of different places. So that was not a majority. You know, back to my childhood, I was never in a place where there was a majority. Um, so you would have everybody on a program you would and and you would do experiential learning because there's so much learning that you can learn about leadership in a room. Mm. But then there's some learning about leadership that you can only mm. learn through experience. Yeah. But experience takes too long. So we've got to produce ways of accelerating experience which means that you could you could take people out into the world and and discover things and um and so com purpose grew and it started in two british cities and ended up in i don't know where it is now but 150 cities around the world and um and and as it went it 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 remained independent the people who could pay, paid. The people who couldn't pay, didn't pay. Um, you got an awful lot of help in kind, so you kept the costs low and you just grew and grew and grew. And, um, and you know, I, I love Com Purpose dearly. Mm. 
I love it for all the things that it does, but also that the alumni then do in their own right, not yeah. because they're con purpose alumni, but because they're who they are. And um, so con purpose was beautiful. Yeah. There was a there's a, a woman right from the beginning of con purpose who was, I think, almost the third member of staff and um, so really one of the founders um, called Alison Coburn. And Alison, um, you know, over the years, there used to be meetings where you would say, do you put Julia in or do you put Alison in? You know, Julia will just sort of wind the whole thing up and cause chaos. <laughs> or do you put in Alison who will produce the calm of silence? <laughs> yeah. And, and then sometimes you used to put the two of us in. But um, certainly Alison has always cared passionately about issues to do in the broadest sense about the environment and we and and so she had ideas of what we could do and I have always believed on in online education not because it's better or worse than face-to-face -face, just it's different mm -hmm. but it does allow you to be global without increasing the carbon footprint of the participants um, and so we weave that idea together um, as somebody who's not in the environmental world the truth is I'm always slightly outraged at how much um, people in the environmental world can be blind about each other and judge each other you know is this about people or is this about nature? Well, it's about both, but actually we're just going to disagree. Um, you know, and so, and people in the environment not liking the private sector. Well, I think some of the greatest innovations to do with the environment are going to come from the private sector. So whether you like them or not, that's not the issue. You've got to figure out how to work with them. So, so producing a lot of the logic of com purpose that had been about place, but making it about a sector and with a broad definition of the sector being the environment and um, seemed so powerful. And Alison was the extraordinary person who could make this happen. Um, and then uh, I think, you know, she could see how the curriculum would weave together. She knew how to make it happen. She knew the people who could who would convene around the idea and trust her from all the different sectors because she'd been at Compa for such a long time. So she claimed it and it was beautiful. Uh, I claim the name. It was me who, um, it, was, it was the concept that sky blue is the color of the sky if there are no cloud, clouds at high noon. And a sky blue just, it, actually it was, you know, the name Com Purpose. I had the idea in the bath many years ago, the name, and the name Sky Blue probably came out of a shower. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, Sky Blue is, is exactly, you know, it's got, a, it's got a whole connotation of high noon, mm. you know. And it's always uh, there, actually. It's, it's always there. there. It's, it's there. high noon. Sometimes it's hidden. You've got it, you know, there's so many powerful things. And then it has to be said also, you know, I get so annoyed with my generation um, you know, there are too many people in my generation, not all, but there are a lot who sort of, you've got a certain amount of, you know, we told you so. Well, you know, part of it is you don't get a prize for telling me so, you know, now pull your sleeves up if this is the moment. Yeah. Stop going on about I told you so. And yeah. this is the moment. Now, now seize it. Yeah. In this, yeah. And don't get stuck by your own blindnesses. You know, we in the NGO sector often have such passions that our passions give us a blindness to anybody who doesn't share the same passion. And the truth is, whatever I'm passionate about, you're not necessarily going to be passionate about. But that doesn't mean you're a bad person. You know, um, I have to allow other people to have different passions. Um, yeah, and going back to the so, other sense of diversity of that, 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 yeah, and including and everyone being part of that bigger jigsaw. Um, and given, yeah. given what we're facing, if that collaboration does not happen, we're doomed. 
And I've been interested in, um, I think Daniel Wall, um, her beautiful uh, book, Regenerative, um, Designing Regenerative Cultures. And he said about that even, our, you know, even Darwin's sort of competition um, theory, which then, you know, the whole, whole capitalism, whole um, our leadership actually is only part of, um, was built in the sort of the, under the context of um, Adam, oh my goodness, who was the economist? You know, it was just part yeah. of the, it was Darwin's thinking was, or his, you know, it was only. Adam uh, Smith. Adam Smith, you know, it was only, um, it was taken out of context and only put in context of this, of this type of economy where actually collaboration and cooperation, which is the natural world is full of it, you know, full of examples. Well, and that, this, that is our true nature. Oh, we wouldn't have vaccines if the scientists hadn't collaborated. But I think the other thing, going back to the women issue, is is you know um, how are we going to how in the early days did we did we get people in refugee camps to recognise what COVID was and what they had to do? You got the women together. How do you persuade people to take vaccines? You get the women together. How do you get people you know, to vote? You get the women, you know. You get the women together. And then as soon as the task is achieved, you brought them out of isolation because you need them. And as soon as the task is achieved, yeah, or just clamp off you go out. back into isolation again. Um, you know, women need to emerge from isolation and to drive this collaboration in a way that is natural to them. Yeah. And in a way that they know how to do. Yeah, and I like that net sort of nature, really, really sensing into your own, yeah, your own drivers. I really do believe, well, my angle, I suppose, women emerging in isolation. I really see that, you know, women emerging from COVID or the quarantine, really that urge, that longing to be with mother nature, you know, the sort of, the, and even, you know, and uh, males, just generally that this whole, well, I'm choosing to see this, um, that people are really orientating to the, yeah, to nature, yeah, mother nature, their connection, their sense Absolutely. of belonging, um, that sense of regardless of where I am or what situation. Mother, mother nature can be pretty cruel to him too sometimes, so. But that's, but that's also part of us. We can be pretty cruel. And actually, she's a beautiful, she... I love uh, Meredith Little, a uh, founder of uh, School of Lost Borders. She talks about um, that nature is the ultimate pure mirror. There's no filters. Like if I talk to you, you've got your own biases and, and views and of the world. But actually, Mother Nature, there's just a purity between that. I mean, it's a little godlike in many respects, you know, isn't it? Um, but so she will, and I love going actually going out to nature where it does mirror back our darkness, our fears as well as their gifts. So, yeah. What, what is your mm -hmm. um, connection with nature? What have you, yeah, in that respect? My connection with nature, um, here. I mean, we have um, incredible sadness. Um, we have a copper beach that's about 350 years old and, um, Sadly, it's now um, had to come down over Christmas because it's, um, oh. you know, it, it's it's right that it has, but we haven't brought it down too much so that the animals can get can live in it for the next fifteen years. But um, oh, there is it, real pain in there. That's a you know, yeah. Oh, uh, this place without that copper beech will be anyhow. But there's lots of copper beech growing. We we have trees. I love trees. Uh, my, I, I love trees. Um, we have um, many, um, many trees. I'm looking at them now. Um, and they'll all be here long after I'm gone. Was that expression? What is it? Um, when's the right time to, to plant a tree? <laughs> Ten years ago or today. 
But I um, actually a couple of people on the podcast have said that actually when the when a tree that was really dear to them had to go had to be felled, or the sense of real loss, real you know like a real death, and they, and they're actually sitting with that and what that means and and one of my kids will hardly speak to me. <laughs> Because of COVID, he hasn't come down to see it. And um, yeah, no, trees are extraordinary things. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, and do you see, you know, in terms of, if I say, like conversing with the earth? I wouldn't say I conversed with the earth. I know I'm... Um, Yeah, I I would I have um, a pond down the bottom, and I go swimming in it. And sometimes you you float in the middle of it, and you can hear something being said to you. But um, but the truth is, Penny, um, I I do remember one of my kids. Um, I was in the bath one day and he came, I can't remember which one, one it was, when he was about 18, came in, who was going travelling and said to me, Mum, um, you know, why do you run your life so fast? And and my honest answer, he was sitting on the loo and it was it was the, the oldest one, actually, I remember that. He was sitting on the loo and I was lying in the bath and, and my answer was, you know, I run my life so fast because if I slowed down, I'd have to ask myself all the questions that I don't believe I'll ever find the answers to. So I, I, I think that you do more seeking the answers than I do. And I probably don't bother to try and seek the answers because I genuinely don't believe I'll find them. Um, but I think that that in speed and in action and in meeting people, I suppose for me, meeting people and talking to people and having proper conversations with people is the equivalent of you talking to the earth. And I do think that we're all, you know, that's part of it, isn't it? I mean, I do think, you know, my big thing about, you know, deepening our relationship with ourselves, each other and the earth that is our home, you know, I think, that you're part of that. I think that in terms of that, that you really do connect with people's, you know, deep beliefs and values. Profoundly, profoundly wow. interested in other human Absolutely. beings. Absolutely. And there's such a faith of that and the diversity of that, you know? So it's so, yeah, so powerful. And I, But I love this, this cropping up of this, I think sort of water is your element or sort of <laughs> something about that. But I, but even the metaphor of that, like I like playing with metaphors, you know, where it is the, the tranquility of a pond and the, the fertility of that. And, and then this rushing, you know, because, you, you know, you're a rushing current at times. You know, there's the waterfall what what's julia's idea now yeah. what kind of chaos is julia going to cause now but then, but also the ocean you know like i love actually you filling that sort of the you know so much of it as the water just and just that literally that movement actually i do see that in you i, I know you're not yeah you're a well i'm the same thing it's like i paint and i yeah. i don't paint well, I paint badly and I, I'm relaxed about painting badly, but I enjoy doing it. But I can't, I can't paint still life. Yeah. I have to paint movement. Yeah. Yeah. Make things happen and you do, and you make oh, this ripple. Yeah. You do. You create ripples. And yeah, I'm going with that metaphor. That's what I'm going to go for. <laughs> oh. Will we put a pause? Well done, Penny. Oh, I do. I just, oh, thank you. Thank you so very, very much, Julia. So we'll put a pause here and see you back for the next Earth Converse podcast. In the meantime, go out and enjoy Earth, one conversation at